Okay, I'm going to talk about digital radio modulation that Bita and I have been playing with. Um, some of this is really um, fairly introductory, uh, introductory material into uh, uh, modern radio coding uh, stuff. Um, that's mostly because I'm kind of a rank beginner in this. I've been doing uh, digital radio modulation and decoding stuff for almost three years now. Um, um, some of you probably have more experience in that in this than I do. Um, so where I make a mistake, please raise your hand and let me know. Um, I'm sure Bdale will not feel shy at all. Um, like I say, I haven't been doing this very long, and a lot of this was new to me just a couple of years ago. Um, and so it's been a huge amount of fun for me to learn about an area of software and hardware design that I kind of didn't even know existed and have gotten to do, uh, uh, re relearn a lot of the maths that I did in school when I was uh, an undergraduate um, and got to redo a lot of interesting software design uh, methodologies as well. Uh, a lot different from my day job as a systems programmer um, and so uh, a lot of this stuff was uh, a huge amount of fun. Um, I uh, used to kid B. Dale when we started on this project that um, his hardware designs were simply a way for me to get a huge amount of fun building embedded software. Um, and I was really grateful for him spending all of his time slaving away constructing hardware so that I could go have fun building software. Um, and then unfortunately uh, he suggested that maybe I should help out with some of the hardware designs if I wanted to try my own little project. Um, and now I'm desperately hoping he'll want to take over some of the drudgery of software so that I can go <laughs> build fun hardware. <laughs> yeah, we need more. We need, we need the, yeah, we have a, a multi-level minion hierarchy. It's kind of the pyramid scheme of minionry. And so as you become more advanced in your minionness, you need to gain minions under you. Okay, I want to talk about modulation schemes, forward error correction, convolution coding, perturbity decoding in particular. Um, and uh, I have a, little, a short little section on the interleaving stuff as well that we're using. Uh, most, of the, most of the modulation stuff is, is a direct result of the hardware choices that we made, but the hardware choices that we made were informed by the fact that the hardware supported something we didn't think was crazy. Um, there's a few, a few uh, important terms that I'm going to be coming across in my talk. Uh, BER, the bit error rate, uh, it's the raw frequency of bad data, uh, usually expressed in magnitudes like 10 to the minus 6th or 10 to the minus 100th bits of er you know, error. Um, uh, uncoded systems that don't use forward error correction like to talk in terms of things like 10 to the minus 1th or 10 to the minus 2nd bits, uh, uh, error bit rates, um, and that's why we don't use uh, systems without error correction. Um, EB, the energy per bit, uh, it's kind of the transmit power divided by the bit rate. So you've got 10 watts of uh, transmit power and 100 kilobits, so you divide those two and you kind of get the amount of power per bit. I think it's measured in joules. I really had a hard time finding the units for that, but it, that, that's the only, only unit that makes sense to me there. Uh, N0 is so the spectral noise density. Uh, it's noise power divided by the bandwidth, so if, you have a, if your channel is 100 kilohertz wide and you have you know, 100 watts of power, then you can kind of get the notion of how much power uh, noise per hertz is the units of that, it's kind of watts per hertz. Uh, and the, the, interesting, the inter interesting unit that we use in uh, most coding scheme analysis and most processing gain analysis is this, the EBNO number, the EB, uh, energy per bit divided by the, the noise per hertz, uh, the spectral energy density. And that gives you, kind of gives you a normalized notion of how good your coding system is, independent of the bit rate of the system and independent of the, ch of the uh, actual transmission technology. So if you're talking about, okay, so how good is my, my turbo code? Uh, the turbo code is going to tr be, uh, be in terms of uh, what, what's my EBNO number to get a particular BER, right? So uh, if, if I have to have uh, 10, uh, 10 dB of EBNO to get a BER 10 to the minus fifth, that's not as good a coding scheme as something which only requires 5 dB of EBNO to get the same, the same, the same error rate. Uh, process gain. Uh, processing gain is the improvements in the EBNO numbers from using a modulation scheme. So different modulation schemes uh, like uh, DSSS or FM or AM will have different process gains. And those are inherent in just the modulation scheme. There's no, there's no gain from additional transmitter power. There's no gain from fancy antennas. It's just you chose a smarter modulation scheme. You get to win. Um, people who use things like uh, on-off keying or AFSK, they get to lose because they chose a poor modulation scheme. Uh, so in this case, smart people, uh, smart people get to win and use lower power transmitters and get longer range, uh, like from Jupiter. Um, because, 
Yeah, the, the, all of this, all of the, almost all of the stuff I'm talking here was originally designed to get data back from the Pioneer and Voyager deep space missions over the DSN, the deep space network. Um, the Viterbi decoding, uh, the, the convolution coding, uh, Reed Solomon codes, all of that was massively funded by NASA trying to get pictures back from the orbit of Jupiter, which is pretty awesome. Okay, the other kind of gain I want to talk about is the other smart people gain. It's called coding gain. And that's the improvement in the EVNO numbers from using a better signal encoding. Uh, so that's just pure software. You don't have to change the hardware. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is change your modulation and demodulation software bits. And you get to win. Again, another smart people gain. Uh, so we here, here we have two basically free pieces of RF improvements that you don't need to do anything like put more power into the air or build a larger antenna array. Uh, which annoys your neighbors. All you have to do is be smarter about your uh, the, 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 the beyond the receiver bits and beyond the, uh, before the transmitter bits. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about is coding gaining process gain. Okay, frequency shift king. Uh, frequency shift king is uh, in, the, in the audio space is known as frequency modulation or FM. Uh, it's a pretty common technique. Uh, why are we using that? Well, we're using that because that's what our radio chips do, and that, in fact, is pretty much all you can get in, in uh, common off-the-shelf uh, uh, system uh, radio chips. Uh, trying to build a, BP, uh, a binary phase shift keying radio is really pretty hard because you can't just buy a binary phase shift keying trans transmitter without buying all the rest of the uh, in modulation stuff as well. Okay, uh, very simple frequency shift keying. You get one frequency for a zero and one frequency for a one. Okay, so if you're, doing, if you're switching that really fast, so once you're transmitting one frequency and then you turn it off and turn on another frequency, what are you generating in your RF spectrum? You're generating a pile of noise because you change the amplitude of one signal really fast, change the amplitude of another signal really fast, and so you smear noise all across your spe spectrum. So raw FSK is kind of an unpleasant thing to do to the RF environment, so instead what we do is use Gaussian um, shaped frequency shift keying. And that's where you take one signal and just kind of slowly slide it over to the other one with this nice Gaussian curve. Like, you know, a nice little bell curve and it goes back up. So it goes shoo, shoo, instead of going click, click. Um, it's really not any different from a receiving perspective from regular FSK. All that it does is reduce the amount of noise you put in the RF environment, uh, reduces the RF bandwidth that you need in order to uh, transmit the signal. Um, and so it's kind of the nice thing to do. It's like, why would you use regular frequency shift keying when your transmitter supports Gaussian shift, a uh, Gaussian modulated, a uh, Gaussian shaped frequency shift keying? The process gain for frequency shift keying, and in fact, any FM system, um, is, is uh, I could not get a beta in this font, and I'm really annoyed with that, so I'm using capital B here. Please apologize. Uh, the process gain is B squared, where B is just the ratio of the deviation. Uh, so if, you have, if you're deviating by 5 kilohertz deviation, uh, divided by the modulation bandwidth. So you have, uh, if you have a, a 10 kilohertz signal and a 10 kilohertz modulation, then your process gain is unity. You don't get any, gain, you don't get any win from that. If you're deviating by twice as much as your, as your, as your, as your bandwidth, uh, then you get a factor of four in processing gain, which is pretty awesome. Six dB uh, just by baking your, and what's that doing? It's making your signal wider. Okay, this term explains why we use preemphasis in traditional FM signaling. What is preemphasis? Preemphasis is where you amplify the high frequencies of your FM signal, right, and, 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 and uh, roll off the low frequencies of your FM signal. The reason that preemphasis is, is getting you better process gain is those high frequencies are very hard to encode. And so by amplifying those high frequencies, you're getting more process gain for the high frequencies of your regular FM signal. So that's why preemphasis in the FM environment exists. And that's why you hear hiss on an FM radio, because uh, for exactly the inverse reason, that, that white noise is being, the high frequency noise is being amplified because your process gain for that area is actually um, is less than unity. And so you get a bunch of noise coming into the system. Okay, so uh, frequency shift king is pretty good because you get this process gain. You only get the process gain if your raw signal to noise ratio of the signal is about 10 dB. Right, so the carrier to noise ratio of your, of your raw FM signal needs to be at 10 dB before you start getting any process gain. And that's why for a really weak signal, you don't want to use frequency shift keying because with a really weak signal, your raw signal to noise ratio is less than 10 dB and all of a sudden your process gain starts to turn into process fail because you actually start losing your FM capture and all of this disappears and your FM signal goes into the mud and you get no signal out. Okay. What's another really common frequency, uh, common modulation technology? It's called direct sequence spread spectrum. 
Uh, people have heard of that? Yeah. It's a really simple, a really fairly simple technology. You take your signal with a pseudo random noise sequence, uh, usually at a really much higher frequency than your, than your, um, than your, uh, than your signal. Uh, usually, a, um, it should be a, a, a fraction of your actual uh, carrier frequency in order to get things lined up correctly. Uh, the chip rate is the, is the rate of this pseudo-random sequence. And then you just multiply or XOR the two values together and modulate the carrier with the result of that. Um, if you're using uh, frequency shift keying, you're going to smear the data across a wide spectrum. This is usually actually used with binary phase shift keying. And again, you take this really high frequency signal now and modulate your, uh, modulate your carrier with it. And what does that do to your bandwidth of your signal? It makes it really wide. And is that typically good if you have a really wide frequency? No, your receiver has to have a really wide carrier. All the noise gets added in. But what happens is when you demodulate that, you basically collapse all of that bandwidth back down into your original signal, and you take all the noise. I've got a lovely, lovely picture in a minute here, I hope. Yeah, I think so. I'll show you the picture. Uh, the demodulation effectively divides the noise by the chip to bit rates. So your, um, your process gain turns into this chipping rate, which is the speed of your pseudo-random number, um, divided by the uh, bit rate of the original signal. So if you have a chip rate of, uh, of a megahertz and a bit rate of 100 kilohertz, you're getting a process gain of 10, which is pretty awesome. Again, all you have to do is be smarter about your software. There's no difference in your radio. You're just modulating faster. So another, an, another win for smart people. Uh, binary phase shift keying is almost always what we use with, uh, with direct sequence spread spectrum. Uh, you just have two symbols at 180 degrees out of phase with each other. And so a one is this signal and a zero is this signal. And how do you tell the difference between those two? Well, you kind of, you know, modulate them so you can, t so you're only interested in where the, where the phase shifts. And that, that gives you a, a signal between zero and one. Because you can tell where this phase shifts, but you can't tell what the current phase is very easily. Um, the process gain of this, of course, is the chip rate over the data rate. Okay, why aren't we using this? This seems like the smart people encoding technique. Why doesn't Altus Metrum use this? <laughs> we can't get parts that do this. So we may have to like, build our own custom silicon neck so we can do uh, uh, direct sequence sped spectrum. Because this is clearly, I mean, for digital radio, this is the only one you would really want to use. Uh, this is what telephones use. This is what digital TV, use, TV uses. This is what uh, satellite communication uses. This is what everything uses. It's clearly the right plan. Here's the picture of what, can you see this at all? Almost, yeah. Um, OK, so here, here's how direct sequence spread spectrum works. You, you start with this narrow band information signal. And then you multiply it by this, or you XOR it with this really high frequency um, pseudo random sequence. And you smear your signal over a huge uh, swath of bandwidth. But the amplitude is lower, right? Because you've taken your signal and you've divided it out over a whole much more space. And so your amplitude is lower. Now I'm going to mix in some of this, some narrow band noise right here. Oh, you can't see my mouse. I apologize. Uh, mix in a, a pile of narrow band noise. And the awesome part is when I demodulate, I actually take that narrow band noise and I multiply the signal again by that pseudo, the same pseudo random sequence. What does that do to my narrow band noise? Ha, <laughs> it spreads it out over this huge spectrum. What does it do to my original signal? Oh, I'm multiplying back in that pseudo random sequence, which gets rid of all of that noise and gives me only my low bandwidth signal again. And so I've got this huge amplitude of the signal and a very tiny amplitude of the noise. Kind of pretty awesome, huh? That's where the coding gain comes from, uh, the process gain in direct sequence spread spectrum comes from. You can get rid of these spikes, which means that uh, direct sequence spread spectrum radios are very immune to jamming. Because if you just give me a huge carrier spike in the middle of my signal, <laughs> I don't care. I can receive it anyhow. And another one that I'm not going to touch on very much is audio frequency shift keying. And that's where you take an audio signal and you put it into the mic input in your radio. So this is the old AX25 disaster, where you'd actually take an audio signal out of a Bell 202 modem and feed it into your FM transmitter. Well, if you feed it into your single sideband transmitter, um, you're just taking an audio signal and muxing it with your transmit signal. And that just turns into frequency shift keying. So that works pretty well. So people that were experimenting with this kind of stuff with HF gear and SSB were like, hey, this is pretty awesome. We're getting credible performance by just feeding audio signals into the mic inputs of our SSB radios. And then the people tried this on FM. And on FM, it's kind of a disaster. With FM, you end up, you end up on the wrong side of your, of your process gain on FM because the frequencies of the Bell 
uh, 202 signals are really close to the frequencies of the actual of the, of the deviation. And so you end up getting very little FM process gain. Um, OK. And of course, the last one I just wanted to mention was on-off keying. Uh, this is really bad. We just key the transmitter on and off. Um, usually, they use Gaussian-shaped uh, uh, keying on and off. If you ever, who, who does uh, CW? Anybody play with CW? Yeah. Yeah, I don't believe you, BDL. <laughs> Yeah, moon bounce. Yeah, okay. Uh, and that uses on-off keying, um, and of course, it's lovely because in th you have a you know you have the, you have a very low data rate and a really simple transmitter. Uh, the problem, of course, is that you have uh, a very broad spectrum because you're keying again a transmitter on and off, and you get no process gain at all. But in a weak signal environment in the FM world, you don't get any process gain anyhow. But anybody who's doing anything clever in moon bounce should be using what kind of modulation scheme? Binary phase shift keying with a DSSS. That would be the only sensible plan. No, you should use JoJo code just to get that one. Yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> Probably true. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about process gain and modulation techniques. So we all learned that the radios you can buy do Gaussian frequency shift keying, and it works okay as long as you have a signal to noise ratio of better than 10 dB. Uh, if, you do, if you don't have that, if you're in a much weaker signal environment, you want to use direct sequence spread spectrum with binary phase shift keying. Pretty simple. Uh, we now want to talk about forward error correction. Um, I know there are a lot of people that have built digital radios that don't use forward error correction. Uh, they're insane. Uh, don't listen to them. Just nod and, you know, nod and say, that's very nice, dear. I'm glad you have a radio. Um, but anybody, anybody doing anything sensible in uh, digital radio is going to use forward error, error correction because, again, it's free gain. It costs you zero dollars. It costs you just a bit of software. Um, uh, and so all that forward error correction does, of course, is add extra, ec extra bits to the data. You add a bunch of redundant information to your signal, and then on the, on, the, on the reception end, you can look at that redundant information and help it regenerate the data. Um, there are a bunch of different uh, forward error correction techniques. I'm only going to talk about convolution codes because that's the only one I've implemented. Uh, I read up a bunch on turbo codes, and I think I almost understand how turbo codes work, and they're basically concatenated convolution codes. So it's very similar notions, and a lot of the things uh, in convolution codes also apply to turbo codes. Um, the other uh, error correction technique that I know that I've heard about a bunch about is Reed-Solomon coding, and those are much longer block codes. And I wish I understood how they work, and I just don't. It's kind of sad. Maybe someday I'll have to implement Reed-Solomon codes. That's the one thing I've learned in my in my engineering career is until I implement something, I have no idea how it works. I can read as much as I want about something, and until I actually go and write it. So how did I learn uh, about com how did I learn about languages? I wrote compilers. Uh, how did I learn <laughs> <laughs> how, how did I learn about graphics? I wrote graphic systems. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a low level and very tedious way. So just, I, just keep learning about <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's just because BDL gets more toys out of it. <laughs> So one of the big uh, things, so forward error correction is to be able to recover data at lower powers and that uh, lower, lower power levels. That's obvious because we're getting free gain here. So I can use the same transmitter and the same receiver and get uh, a reliable data channel at lower power levels. Uh, I can survive uh, impulse noise. Um, if you live in any place in the, in, on a continent, there's going to be an aircraft radar system around you somewhere. And when that aircraft radar sweeps over your area, it's going to give you a nice big spike of RF energy in the middle of whatever packet you were trying to transmit. Uh, using a little bit of forward error correction, you can kind of notice that there was a big spike of ick in the middle of your RF data and correct right through it. And that's one of the, one of the, one of the keys to forward error correction. Um, convolution coding is, is what I've done. That's because it's what the CC1111 did uh, or does and what the CC1120 does not do. Um, there are two kind, common kinds of convolution codes, uh, the non-recursive, non-systematic uh, codes. A systematic convolution code is one which replicates the input in some of the output bits. So a systematic convolution code, um, if, you were, if you had a perfect transmission, you could just throw away all the, all the error correcting bits and extract the signal directly from it. The, the original signal bits would ap appear in the output. A, a non-systematic code doesn't have the original signal bits appear anywhere in the output. Um, and uh, they're usually used in, and that's what I've implemented, is a, is a non-recursive, non-systematic code. The recursive, recursive systematic codes, uh, that's what turbo codes use. And so uh, a turbo code is basically two convolution codes uh, that are using a recursive systematic uh, convolution. 
Uh, recursive means that you take the output from uh, some stage of the, of the convolution. Um, wait a minute. Yeah, I have, some more, I have some more pictures here to show how convolution. You take some output and feed it back, and you provide a little feedback within the encoder. The rate, there are two terms, that the, the two relevant terms for convolution codes. The rate, which is the, the ratio of the input to the output bits. Uh, almost all the convolution codes anybody uses any, any, uh, anywhere these days take one input bit and generate n output bits. So we talk about 1 over n convolution coding. Um, if you throw away a random or a collection of, the, of those output bits, you can generate convolution codes that have an effective bit rate of some other fraction. So if you, if you were generating uh, two output bits for every input bit and you threw away every third output bit and just discarded it and used error correction to recover it, uh, to recover that data, that would be a two-thirds rate uh, convolution code. Uh, the constraint length is the other important part about a convolution code, and that's the number of output symbols that are affected by a single input bit. Uh, and output symbols, by output symbols, I mean the, uh, a collection, however many output uh, bits are generated, that collection. Uh, so in a constraint length three, uh, uh, rate one half constraint length three, three encoder, which I'm going to show the example of here, you have six bits generated for every three bits input. So one bit change on the input can change any of those six bits on the output. So that's what the constraint length means. After that constraint length, a change in the input bits can have no effect on the output because the constraint is, that's what the constraint says. Constraint, for, uh, constraint length for non-recursive co uh, co uh, encoders are really easy to understand. You just look at the number of bits that are being put together. They're not recursive. For recursive ones, it's a bunch more maths. Um, I haven't quite figured out how those work. Someday, maybe. Maybe I'll have to implement one uh, when I do turbo codes next. This is why we use convolution coding. Uh, this is a, a coding gain chart uh, that I stole from, excuse me, uh, borrowed from this free, uh, freely available theory and practice of error control codes uh, paper. Um, you can see here, so on the vertical axis, you have the, e the, the EBNO number, uh, the probability of the, or the, the, pro the BER. This is the probability of an error. Uh, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8. So that's the number of, that's your, bit, your basic, your bit error rate. And on the axis down here, you have your EBNO number. So this is a D in dB, not, a, not as a ratio. And so you can see that as, the, uh, as you want to have a more and more reliable channel, which is to say as your uh, BER gets smaller and smaller, uh, then your convolution code is giving you more and more gain uh, in that environment for the same um, EBNO number. So at a typical stuff, you know, like you want one bit and a million error. And so your, your, con your convolution coding gain from that, I can't see this at all on my screen either. Um, for 10 to the minus 6, you have a coding gain of about, you know, 2, two to 3 dB for a convolution code. This is a bunch of different convolution codes you can see down here. Uh, the rate 1 half constraint K, uh, that's the one that I'm going to give you an example of here. So it's that green line. It's the worst one, but it's the simplest one to understand. Um, and the rate 1 half, uh, well, it doesn't have the rate 1 half K equal 4, which is what the CC1111 uses, but it's, you know, it's somewhere in there, 2 or 3 dB. Again, free gain for just doing clever software. Here's, here's, here's how a convolution coder works. Uh, S0 and S1 are just little delay boxes. So that's like uh, it saves the previous bit and passes it along. It's just a shift register. Uh, so you hand one input bit in. So you initialize S0 and S1 to 0, push a bit in, and generate two bits out. And then you just wash, rinse, and repeat. Um, and so as you can see, after three bits go through this encoder, it's, 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 it doesn't have any memory beyond three bits because it only has two state. Uh, two, pieces of, uh, two pieces of memory in the shift register, and then the bits get dumped into the usual bit bucket. Here's, a, here's what the CC11 uses, the rate 1 half uh, k equal 4 non-recursive coder. Um, you can see here that bits are different, and they're only different in the fact that one, so the, the, the operation down here that I'm showing is it's just XOR. It XORs all the bits together. So you can see bit 1 and bit 0 have a, have a different collection of bits being XORed together. The bottom bit gets all four XORed together and the top bit just gets three of them. So they're slightly different in the output. OK, how does this, how does this matter? You've got this crazy encoding. What's this going to do? Well, what it does is it constrains the output. Um, uh, uh, it constrains the output so that when you have a, a, a particular sequence of input bits, you get a different, uh, different collection of output bits. Of course, with, um, I'm going to skip over that one and, and uh, explain the trellis diagram here. Um, if your previous state was 0, 0, so S0 and S1 both have zeros in them, and you get a new 0 bit, then your new state is going to be S0, 
And the convolution encoder, which you can see here, this, this is the one we're working with here, if S0 and S1 were 0 and you put a new 0 bit in, what are bit 1 and bit 0 going to be coming up? They're both going to be 0 because I'm XORing a bunch of zeros together. If the previous state of S0 and S1 were 1, were both 1 and I stuck in a new 0 bit, then the output of the convolution encoder is going to be uh, uh, bit 1 will be 1 and bit 0 will be 0. So the output bits, bit 0 and bit 1, depend upon not only the current bit, but the previous two bits as well. And that's what this trellis diagram shows here. It shows that if you were in state 0, 0 and you got a 0 bit, then you would transmit 0, 0, that's the bit 1 and 0 numbers there, and your new state would be 0, 0. If you were in state 0, 0 and you got a 1 bit, then you would transmit 1, 1, and if you go look at the little uh, the little uh, XOR thing, you'll note that both of the bits turn to 1, and your new state would be 0, 1, because you just shift, remember, you're just shifting bits into the S0 and S1 state. If your state was 1, 0, and you transmit a 0 bit, blah, blah, blah. You can see, th so those are all the eight different transitions. Each input state has two transitions, depending upon the next bit, and you get to a new output state. Okay, so that's a simple little trellis diagram. And that's going to help us explain how decoding this thing works. Decoding it is kind of fancy. Um, I know that uh, convolution codes were developed in the 60s and 70s, and I know that people were using other algorithms other than the one I'm going to describe to decode them before then, uh, sequential uh, uh, convolution decoders. I have no idea how they work because um, in the 70s, Andrew Viterbi figured out that uh, a cute little software hack that he put together could effectively decode these. And he knew that it wasn't as good as the existing massively cool state-of-the-art hardware that other people were doing because he had only invented it himself, so it wasn't very cool until somebody proved that it was optimal and all the other techniques disappeared. <laughs> the shy engineer. Andrew Viterbi went on to uh, help, uh, help um, found Qualcomm and invent CDMA and do other cool things. So he's an awesome guy, except for the fact that he works in patented stuff. And so we love him for having actually released the description of the Viterbi coding, uh, for Viterbi decoding for convolution decoding, and we hate him for locking up CDMA at Qualcomm. So, you know, some people go astray. <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, so Viterbi decoding turns out to be provably optimal for decoding convolution codes. But it's important to realize that Viterbi decoding and convolution encoding are really very separate notions. Convolution codes can be decoded in a number of ways. This algorithm happens to be optimal. It has another really cool features. It's a small piece of code. I think my decoder is 30 lines of code. Um, it has fixed memory requirements. That is to say, once you specify the code, you have a fixed amount of memory needed in order to, de to de decode arbitrarily long input packets, which is awesome because that means you can build hardware to do this, which is always nice because hardware is always faster than software. Uh, NASA built a massive Viterbi decoder for one of their uh, deep space missions uh, that was um, had, I'm trying to remember, it was like a, a, a rate, one, rate one quarter k equals 8 encoder with like 16,000 states to decode this thing. Uh, and they, build, they built hardware for that <laughs> because they could. It was fixed amount, sometimes large, but uh, yeah, in, fixed in any case. So what does the Viterbi uh, decoder do? Um, at each node in the trellis, remember our pretty little trellis diagram, you measure the distance between the symbol you received and each of the two possible transitions. So if you are in state 00, zero and you see a 00, zero symbol coming in, uh, then you know that the, the, the measured distance from that to, oh, that must have been a 0 on the input, uh, is only 0. But the distance measured, let's go back and look at the trellis diagram. Yeah, oh, that was it. So if I'm in state 00, zero and I receive 00, zero on the input, then the distance, from, the distance from that symbol to the transition to new state 00, zero is 0, because I receive 00. zero and the, the expected value to go to state uh, zero, 0, is also zero, 0, so the distance there is 0. But the distance to get to state zero, 01, where I would have expected to see a 1, 1, that distance is 2. And so you just keep measuring those distances. Uh, you sum the distances all the way across through the whole packet. Uh, and then you choose the path 
with the least distance from the received path. And that's how it's kind of provably optimal, right? You've got the, le you've got the path with the least total error through the entire reception. Um, there's two different kinds of Viterbi decoding. You have hard decision, where you have just, we all, where, you, where your receiver only gives you ones and zeros. And then you have soft decision, where the receiver says, eh, you know, I'm not really sure what that was. It was more like a one than a zero, so I'm going to say it's a 0.7. Uh, soft decision is awesome for frequency shift keying because what does your FM demodulator give you? Your FM demodulator actually gives you a frequency between the two bounds of your, of your modulation, right? It says uh, that was you know, 0.7 volts instead of 1 volt or 0 volts. And so your frequency shift receiver uh, automatically gives you these soft decision values as long as you can bother to get the hardware to uh, hand them to you, uh, which the hardware that we're currently using is very reluctant about. Um, the benefit of using soft decision is that you get about 2 dB uh, in, additional, uh, in additional coding gain over hard decision. And again, guess what? That's free. You just have to have uh, software that does it. There's no additional transmitters or receivers or antennas or power supplies. It's free receiving power. When I discovered that our hardware did not have any support for, or did not have nice support for getting soft decision data out of it, I wrote a little note off to the manufacturer and said, you know, this part is awesome, fabulous transmitter, awesome receiver, but I don't get any soft decision data except one bit at a time per interrupt. And the manufacturer said, yeah, you should just use the hard data. It's way easier to get. And it's like throwing 2 dB on the floor? I don't think so. How many interrupts can my processor take per second? And it turns out that the STM32L is quite happy to take one interrupt per bit. Okay, so here's a, here's a, a, a description of what a, a, full, a, a larger trellis diagram looks like when receiving correct data. You can see here the input bits that I have here, and that these are the input, these are the outputs of the, of the encoder, right? So here's, the, here's my tr uh, receiver, here's what my receiver is getting. So my transmitter, the original input data here into the transmitter is at the top line, and the next line down is what the, in what the uh, uh, convolution encoder generated. And then I'm going to walk the trellis diagram, and I draw, drew out uh, the state transitions and the, and the costs and the costs associated, the, the, the error costs associated. And again, you're summing the error costs all the way across. And so every time you see, every time you see um, a state transition that increases that number, then that state transition had a cost. And though, again, those state transitions are the difference between the expected value along that path, which I'm not showing here, and you can only see in the original trellis diagram, and the actual symbol that was received. Um, these slides will be available. The, uh, this, this diagram I drew myself. So in this particular one, um, all the input symbols I received were exactly correct, which is awesome because that means my, that, it, well, it's actually kind of boring because uh, that meant my receiver was too close to my transmitter and I wasted a bunch of transmit power. Uh, <laughs> Which is never good, right? But as you can see, the cost for the cost for this bold path through the trellis diagram, which shows you the state transitions that I'm making uh, through the system, the costs are always zero. And so you get to the right-hand side, you notice that there's a zero, and then you just follow that line back to the input. There's a unique path back to the input, and that's the data that you are transmitted. And so the the, the receiver uh, shows you what uh, that shows you what you got out of the output. Pretty simple. Here's what happens when you get a bit lost, just one bit lost. In this particular case, the second word here uh, is received as 10 instead of 11, which is what was actually transmitted. I mean, you can see here that the, uh, at this, in this second case here, you have two states that both have exactly the same cost. You got a 10 instead of a 11, and the receiver is like, heck, I don't know. It could have been a 1 bit. It could have been a 0 bit. They look the same to me. And so you have the same error cost. And so at this point, if I just if I stopped receiving at this point, that would be an ambiguous piece of data. I would have no idea what the correct what the correct data uh, would have been at that point. But I'm going to receive another bit. Now I've got this new zero one bit. And in this case, the zero one bit, if it's if it's a zero bit transition from the one zero to zero zero, then the cost of that is zero because that's a valid reception from that point. But here in this other one that also had one error cost. If I, got a, if I got a one bit, that also would be a legitimate transition from one one to one one. And that, so the error cost of that is also zero. And so you can see at this point, I'm still confused. I have two states that both have cost of one. 
because of this one bit failing up here. And at here, at here, now we finally find out that this one, the two possible state transitions that it could have received, both of them would have cost more than zero. And so both of them, uh, both of them would, uh, would have a cost more than the correct one in the middle there, this, uh, this uh, zero one state here. So you can see that the, the decoder caught up after a couple of uh, a possible ambiguous bits. If you get more errors, then the length of time that it takes to recover from them is even longer. But you can see here at the end, it's still pretty clear. You have one path back that has a cost of one, and then you have other paths back that have higher costs. And so it's pretty clear you follow that one back all the way back to the beginning. And so that's really how a convolute, that's how a Viterbi decoder works. It decodes the entire packet, and it starts at the end and walks its way back to the beginning to pick out all the correct bits. There are optimizations involved where you can say, oh, you know, I don't have to go all the way back to the beginning. I can start partially decoding the, the, the the data after I've gotten a bunch of bits in, and it's unlikely that older bits will have changed. Um, okay, I implemented this in software. Um, what? Okay, I've got, yeah, two more slides. Uh, I implemented the obvious algorithm. Um, the obvious algorithm for, was first decoding packets at a rate of about one packet every one second on my STM32L. That was probably not gonna be good because I'm transmitting 10 packets a second. Um, I optimized that for days. Uh, got down to 14 milliseconds, almost 15 milliseconds per packet. Um, I read Phil Karn's most excellent uh, software implementation with uh, SSC and MMX acceleration. Uh, you can Google for this FEC 3.0.1 code that was from 2007. Um, I meditated over that code for days, and I looked at the source code and I said, how does this work? It's totally Martian code to me. I wrote a lengthy email to Phil asking him a number of questions about how his code worked. Um, and as soon as I'd finished writing the email, I understood how the code worked, of course. Uh, I went off and implemented the improvements, and now the thing decodes it in about 5.7 milliseconds per packet. So I have transmitting seven, 10 packets per second. I'm decoding in about 6 milliseconds, so I have plenty of overhead. Oh, and that 5.7 milliseconds per packet, that includes one interrupt per bit coming out of the receiver. So I'm taking uh, 38,400 interrupts per second uh, to get the soft decision data out of the receiver. There's one more thing I'm going to talk about, interleaving. Why do we do interleaving? Inter the problem with that Viterbi decoding and the, and the trellis diagram is if you smash a whole long sequence of bits in a row, it can often just get totally lost. If you smash more than, more than the, the constraint length of the code, you will probably never recover. And so in my k equals 4 code, if I smash five bits in a row, I probably won't get that packet decoded. Um, the nice thing, what you do with interleaving is you take the, in, the output of the encoder and you mix up the bits in some, in some way. Um, the CC1111 does it regularly. Um, I've learned since that the turbo codes do it in a pseudo random way in order to mix the bits up so that they don't get even, even uh, disturbed by periodic noise. Um, it, and mostly the goal here is to reduce the impact of impulse noise uh, when you're decoding stuff. Because the Viterbi decoder is really good at fixing single bit errors as long as it has a couple of bits to recover. But if you have a long sequence of broken bits, it sucks at that. This is how the interleaver works. You put bits in in one direction and you just pull them out in the other direction. And again, these are after the encoder because you need that pair of bits to be uh, to be aligned together. Uh, you don't want to be uh, interleaving individual bits because uh, you want to smash both bits together or get both bits correct. Um, here's what we're doing in the CC1111. Uh, BDL talked about this. It's a rate one half k equal four convolution encoder, soft decision for turbidity decoding. It's exactly what we wanted. Uh, here's what the, um, and so of course, all that we did was choose that transceiver and then set some other parameters, the, uh, the, the symbol rate, the input symbol rate of 19.2 kilobits, the encoded rate of 38 kilobits, of course, it's a half rate encoder, 20 kilohertz deviation for about 100 kilohertz channel bandwidth. Nothing too magic there. The chip loved it. Uh, then we switched to this new chip. Uh, it doesn't have an encoder, it doesn't have a decoder, it doesn't do interleaving, um, and its soft decision data is available at the stunning, uh, stunning rate of one bit per interrupt. Please don't drop an interrupt because that bit will be gone. It's got a single non, uh, the, the register, it has a single register holding a single value. Uh, and overall, uh, FEC is free. All it costs is software, and everybody knows that software is free. That's why we write free, free software, right? 
Uh, GFSK isn't the best encoding available, uh, but it's widely supported in COTS hardware, and when you stick competent FEC on top of it, you get a pretty awesome radio. And that's all I have time for. Questions? I thought I had till 11.30. Yeah. Right. Yeah, of course. The, you can, you can, you can. Uh, so right now, I'm doing a rate one half code. If you want, if you want to, if you want to have a higher error rate, you can use a rate two thirds code or a rate three quarters code. Um, and the and the higher the and the the closer you get to unity, in order, in, or, in other words, the fewer parity bits you're sending, the higher the basic error rate is going to be for a particular EBNO. Yeah. So, so I love when Keith says things like, "If you want a higher error rate." <laughs> If you're willing to tolerate a higher error rate. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just, in, in my, every time he says that, my brain kind of goes, oh. <laughs> um, Yeah, the, the issue here really is if, if you're trying to receive signals from the orbit of Jupiter or something, then it really does, it, it really might be worth transmitting a lot of bits per bit to get marginal improvements in the coding gain, where by marginal I mean in fractions of a dB. But in almost all practical systems, almost everybody out there uses Huge difference. A lot of FEC makes a small incremental improvement. And again, the coding gain is over the uncoded data at the native data rate. So when I talk about a 3 dB coding gain uh, of the coded data over the uncoded data, that's not over the same channel. That's if I have to double the bit rate in the transmitted data, I still get that's the coding gain I'm getting from that coding. So even if I have to double the modulation speed or have the data rate, I still get that coding gain. So it's not, it's not that I'm, yeah, if you, double, if you just double the bit rate, you're going to get, you know, your, your EBNO numbers are going to be divided by, by a factor of two because your energy per bit is divided by two. Uh, but the coding gain is above that. So it takes that into account already. So you transmit twice as many bits, but you're doing forward error correction. So you're losing uh, 3 dB in your, in your uh, energy per bit, but you're gaining that back plus more by the coding gain. Is just awesome. It's 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 usually it's usually it's usually related to the, the to the uh, D free number of the code, which I didn't describe at all. Uh, and the D free number of our codes is five, I think. And so if you if you smash more than five bits, you will not you will not get that packet will not be re, uh, transmitted correctly. Uh, we put a sixteen bit CRC on all the packets, of course. Um, so we check some of the packets when we get them down, and so we throw away ones that have had tr erroneous transmissions. Do you look at the error rate at all and display yes, of course. Uh, and in fact, uh, our UI displays the number of CRC errors in the received packets, so you can tell how many have been ero have been not correctly decoded. It's completely normal to go through an entire rocket flight zone and have that number never go non-zero. Right. But the, the, the objective is you might you might have the signal strength drop way down. And Thanks, guys. Thanks.